Good morning. Good morning. So glad you all are here to worship with us. Will you stand? Let's praise God together. that you're here to worship with us. Um, I want to just share with you something that I had heard this week. Um, we are, of course, in the season of Advent, and I love the season, just the waiting of uh, the birth of our Savior. And um, something I heard that just kind of dawned on me that I'd never really thought of it this way, but us as Christians, we actually experience two Advents, and that is the birth, waiting on the birth of our Savior, but we're also waiting on Christ's return. So we can look at it that way as well, and it's just something that, you know, I heard on a, actually a podcast, and I just never really thought of it that way, but we are, we are also always in a season of Advent where we wait on um, our Savior to return, as the Bible tells us. And also I wanted to share something else with you um, from a devo devotional that I have been reading that just talks about the different names of Jesus. Um, during Advent, and a couple of the songs that we're singing will mention the word Emmanuel, and I wanted to just read you um, what that means. So, Emmanuel is a Hebrew name which appears in the book of Isaiah as a sign that God will protect the house of David. The Gospel of Matthew interprets this as the prophecy of the birth of the Messiah and the fulfillment of Scripture in, in the person of Jesus. The title Emmanuel literally means God with us. Both Isaiah and Matthew affirmed that the Christ who would be born in Bethlehem would be God himself, who came to earth in the form of a man to live among his people. So we can have confidence in God's goodness in Christ, that we, all, that we have all that we need. To know Christ is to know God. We can take great encouragement and comfort in living this side of the cross. 
the faithful people of God in the Old Testament looked forward to the Son of God. And we have seen the fulfillment of God in Christ who lived a perfect life and went to the cross to save us. What a wonderful blessing to know the Son of God in such a way. As we light the second candle of Advent, I want to read a scripture to you. And it is Isaiah 9, 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness.
you can be seated. Good morning, church. You guys sound good this morning singing. Hey, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and grab it. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. We are spending our Advent season this year in Luke chapter 2, and uh, that's where we kicked off last week as well as we kind of look at the uh, different words and phrases from the angel's announcement to the shepherds. And so last week we looked at the the opening words, fear not, fear not, for I have good news of great joy. So what the angel says to the shepherds as the angels appear uh, on that Christmas night. And so we're taking uh, this Advent season, these four weeks of Advent, and we're looking at the different phrases that the angel speaks to the shepherds. And so if you have a Bible with you, we'll be in Luke chapter 2. We're going to be all over uh, the scriptures a little bit this morning, so uh, be ready to, to turn to a few different places, but we're going to camp out here. It'll also be on the screen back here behind me, or if you have your Version Bible app, you can use that as well, and you can follow along there. You just click on more, and then events, Ridge Church should pop up, and you'll have all of today's notes and scripture right there. And so let's look at this together. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8 through 14. It says this, it says, In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields, keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. Now, like I said, last week we we started this off and we looked at these first words, do not be afraid. And we talked about the different fears that maybe we might experience or or feel uh, during the Christmas season. And so today we want to move just a little bit further beyond that. We want to look at this next phrase. And it says this, it says, do not be afraid for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy. I proclaim to you good news of great joy. And so we want to take that phrase, I proclaim to you good news of great joy, and we want to look at that together. And so let me give you some just quick theology around angels, because I I think it's kind of one of the things that we sort of skipped over a little bit last week. We even sang some songs uh, today about the angels' announcements, but uh, angels are uh, not really something that we talk about a whole lot in the context of the church, uh, sometimes for for better or for worse. Uh, But I I do think that for many, many people, Christians, even non-Christians, sort of have an idea of what they believe about angels. And often what I tend to find is a lot of that is uh, a little off base, at least a, a, a little bit here and there, uh, about what we believe about angels. And so we, we do believe in angels. We believe that angels exist. Uh, we believe that angels are created by God. Okay, Angels are created by God. Uh, here's one of those things where I think that, that sometimes we miss this about a little bit of angel theology is that you don't die and become an angel. All right, so like, like when this, this world is done and over with and, and you go to be with the Lord, you don't get angel wings if you reach a certain level of, you know, goodness or, or whatever, right? Every time a bell rings, an angel does not get its wings, okay? Like that's, that's not, I hate to ruin that for you guys, but that's not exactly the way that it works. But 
uh, so we don't die and, and become angels. Angels are created by God. Sometimes angels, they are there for protection. Uh, what we do know about angels is that they are around the throne constantly singing praise and worship to the Lord. You find that in Revelation chapter 5, chapter 6. Uh, you see that right there. And so they protect, they worship Jesus. Uh, the one angel who did not worship Jesus got booted out of heaven. That's Satan. Um, and so we know that about, uh, about Satan. He was an angel booted from heaven. But the main job of an angel, here's the thing. This is where I want to land right here. Is the main job of an angel is to be a messenger. It's to be a messenger. To carry the message of God to whomever God sends the angel to proclaim to. And so in today's passage, in, in these four weeks that we're looking at this, we see an angel show up in the dead of night to these shepherds, shows up to them and proclaims this great message. He says, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Good news of great joy that will be for all people. And so the angel here brings and, and says he proclaims to the shepherds this, this good news of great joy. And so for the second week of Advent, I want to spend a few minutes talking about proclaiming this good news of great joy that will be for all people. And so let me start by asking you this question. Do we, and, and we can say we collectively, but specifically, do you, do, do I, do you, do we, do we love people enough to proclaim to them the good news of great joy? Do we love people enough? Do we love others enough to proclaim to them the good news of great joy? I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon in one of his sermons. He says this. He says, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. And so we're going to take just a really simple approach today to this message, because it's not really meant to be complicated. This is not a complicated message. This is not a, not a complicated thing. We could complicate it if we want to, but it's not really meant to be complicated. And so I'm just going to give you my outline from the beginning here for all you type A people that need to kind of know where we're going. Here it is. It's really simple. Three points. Why should we proclaim the good news? Secondly, who should proclaim the good news? And third, how should we proclaim the good news? Why, who, and how? Really, really simple. And so let's start with the first one. Why should we proclaim the good news. The, this is exactly what the angel does. The angel comes and says, I proclaim to you the good news of great joy. First of all, what is the good news? The good news is the gospel. And the angel gives this to the shepherds. It says that it will be for all people today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. Now, the shepherds would have known exactly what that meant. That would have been a really big deal to them. You see, up to this point, if you go to, and you don't have to turn there, but if you go to Malachi, which Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. When you go to Malachi and you read in chapter 4, it says this, verse 1, it says, For look, the day is coming. The day is coming, meaning that somewhere off into the future, there is a day that is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. The coming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them root or branches. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and playfully jump like calves from the stall. And it goes on, but these are, are the last words from God to prophets who would speak these words to people for 400 years. There would be 400 years of silence between what we see in Malachi chapter 4 and Matthew, the beginning of, or this announcement from the angel actually. And so for 400 years, the people of Israel are just waiting and anticipating. This is the first advent. They're waiting and eagerly anticipating the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Savior. The one that, and that's exactly what Messiah, Savior means. It means one to rescue from darkness. 
which makes even more sense that the angel would appear in a great light in darkness. There's so much, uh, there's so much going on uh, in that. But what the angel does is proclaims this good news, gives them this good news and says, the day has come. It is here. You no longer have to wait. The Savior has come. And so why should we then, why should we proclaim this good news? Why should we do this? Well, first we have to remember what we are proclaiming in our message. Whether we are inviting someone to come and see or we are sharing the gospel directly with them. We are proclaiming that same good news of great joy to other people. Just like the angel proclaimed that message to the shepherds for the first time. We are proclaiming the same message. Proclaim means to speak, right? It means to speak out. It means to to tell. And so to proclaim the good news means that, that we get to tell. We get to go and tell this good news of great joy. And this is often, I think, the message that gets lost during Christmas in our culture. It gets lost. What, what is this good news? What is, what is Christmas about? You know, if you were to uh, ask ten people what Christmas means to them, you'll likely get ten different answers, right? Like if you were to, to just today, like, it'd be fun right? Be fun today. Like, go post this on social media. Go uh, ask people in your family. Just, just go and ask somebody, hey, what does Christmas mean to you? And I promise you, if you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different answers. Actually, you'll get eight different answers. We live in the South. Two people will say Jesus, right? <laughs> Hopefully, you will too. But other than that, like, we'll get, we'll get eight different answers to that question, right? But the, the rest of it will probably be about family, you know, time together, rest, giving, receiving, traditions, nostalgia, you know, whatever. And listen, all of those things are great. All of those things are great. I, I love all of those things. I am for them. But they are secondary to what Christmas is about. Amen? It's about setting our hearts and minds on the fact that to us, on this day, a Savior has been born for us and that Savior is Jesus Christ. That Savior is Jesus Christ. And so second, secondly, very simply, we should proclaim this good news of great joys to others because, first of all, it's what Jesus did, and secondly, it is what we are commanded to do as his followers. If you are a follower of Christ, number one, we follow the example of Jesus. We see Jesus do this very thing. He proclaims the gospel. He proclaims the news that a Savior has come, that He has come, and that He has come to rescue the people from darkness, that He has come to lay down His life as a sacrifice and atonement for sin. But it's second, the other part of that is, is it's what we're actually commanded to do. You know, 78 times, different times actually in the New Testament, We either see Jesus proclaiming the gospel, telling the disciples to proclaim the good news, or we see the disciples and others proclaiming the gospel. 78 different times, Matthew through Revelation. And so we see, first of all, we see and we follow the example of Jesus. But then secondly, we are actually told to go and proclaim. You don't have to turn there, but if you look in Matthew uh, chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 27, it says this. These are the words of Jesus. He says, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in a whisper, listen to what he says, proclaim on the housetops. Proclaim on the housetops. He said, what, here's what Jesus this is always saying. He's saying, whatever happens in your heart, what happens in here, as it changes what's in here shout it out on the rooftops proclaim it speak it on the housetops painting a picture for us that that this proclamation of good news should go out to as many people as possible as many people as possible and so why should we we proclaim the good news because we follow the example of jesus and then secondly he tells us to he tells us to. I don't have to remind us of this because I feel like I say it at, like way, way too often, but I feel like we always just need to be reminded. Jesus says, go and make disciples. That's 
proclamation. That is proclaiming the good news. Go and make disciples. So who, who then? Who should proclaim the good news? Turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, just a couple of pages over, we see this, we see this great story uh, picking up in verse 26. And uh, in this story, what, what we see happen is, is we, we look at, actually just look at verse uh, 27 to start off with. It says this, when he, Jesus, when he got out on land, a demon-possessed man from the town met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes and did not stay in a house, but in the tombs. This is a scene like right out of The Walking Dead, right? Like, here's this naked guy. He's probably all dirty and, you know, whatever. He is possessed by demons. That's plural with an S. It's not just one. That's plural with an S. And it says, and as you read here, you see that, that for as long as anybody has known, this is the way that he has been. For a long time, it says. For a long time he had worn no clothes and did not stay in a house but in the tombs. In the tombs. This is a scary dude, right? This is a scary guy. And he comes up to Jesus. Now, we're not going to read, read all the verses here, but essentially what happens is, is he falls down before Jesus and he begs him. The demons actually inside of the man, they see the authority of Jesus. They see God in the flesh walking up to the to them, and they fall down, the man, the demons inside of the man, they fall down before Jesus, and they beg Jesus not to hurt them. They beg him, don't hurt us. In fact, they, they give, him a little, uh, give him a little idea, like, hey, see those pigs? Put us in those pigs. Like, let us into those pigs. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He casts the demons out, casts the demons out, they go into these pigs, and the pigs go off of a cliff, Right? Pork chops for everybody. But this is exactly, exactly, exactly what happens, right? The man who had been possessed sits at the feet of Jesus. This is what happens next. He sits at the feet of Jesus, and it says that now he is in his right mind. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus now. He has been healed. He has been changed. Like he is, These demons are now gone from him, and he is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And so the translation here is that he had been healed and changed forever by Jesus. Now listen, he had been this way, it says, for a long time, for as long as anybody can remember, for as long as anybody knows, they were like, that guy's crazy. He is possessed by demons. He doesn't even have a home. He sleeps in the tomb with dead people. And he doesn't wear clothes, right? But look at verse 39. Look at what happens here at the end, verse 39. As he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Verse 38, it says, The man from whom the demons had departed begged him earnestly to be with him. But it says Jesus sent him away. Why did Jesus send him away? Look at verse 39. It says, Go back to your home. And tell all that God has done for you. He says, go back to your home. Don't stay here. Don't stay with me. I want you to go. I want you to go back to your home. Why does Jesus tell him to go back to his home? Because once he goes back to his home, they're going to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who are you? Like, What happened to you? We know who you used to be, but look at who you are now. He had been forever changed by Jesus. Jesus says, he, he tells him, he says, go back to your home and tell all that God has done for you. And it says, and he went off, off he went, proclaiming, there's that word again, proclaiming throughout the town. So not just to his family, not just to people who knew him, it says throughout the town, how much Jesus had done for him, how much Jesus had done for him. And so who should proclaim the good news? Who should proclaim the good news is anyone who has been changed by the good news. If you've been changed by the good news, you should proclaim the good news. Think about the, the radical impact Jesus had on this man. You see, when we meet Jesus, we should never be the same if we truly have had an encounter with Jesus. 
We should never be the same. We should have been impacted when we meet Jesus. It's why it's important for us to, to stay in the Word, right? Like I get that for many of us that initially, like that may have happened to you a long time ago. Like, like when I met Jesus, I mean, it was 20 years ago, it was 30 years ago, it was 40 years, it was a long time ago, and, and I feel so far removed from that experience, like I just don't feel that same fire and excitement and, and uh, just invigoration from, from being changed by Jesus in that moment, like I just don't feel it anymore, so I don't get as excited about it as much anymore, and I, listen, I, I get that, I get that. That's why it's important, again, it's, it's why it's important for us to, to stay in the Word, reading and praying and growing. And then for others of us, like, here's the thing, like, change happens as a slow process. It's not like a, a, an immediate, quick, 180-degree turnaround. Sometimes change is a slow process. We call that sanctification, right? It's just the process of being made into the image of Jesus. And that takes time. That takes time for everybody. But if you have had an encounter with Christ, if you have had an encounter with Jesus, if he has saved you, if he, listen, again, remember what Savior means, to be rescued out of darkness, to be changed, radically impacted. And listen, you're like, well, I was never possessed by a demon, and so I was never radically impacted like that. But what, think about this for a minute. What did he, what has Jesus saved you from? What would your life be without Christ? Think about it. Maybe some of you have never taken the time to actually think about that. What would your life be without Christ? Leading you, guiding you, showing you, helping you, convicting you, forgiving you. Paul says, you know, that we become this, this new creation. We're not the same. And if Jesus has changed and impacted your life in a radical way, you should want that for others. You should want that for others. If it, what, what has happened to you should be something that we should want for others. I hope that's what we want for others. If Jesus has not impacted your life, if you would say, you know what, I don't know that Jesus has really impacted my life in any kind of way, then I would say you've probably not really encountered Jesus. It changes you. It changes you. And so who should proclaim the good news? Anyone that the good news has been, or anyone who, who, who has experienced the good news. That's who should proclaim the good news. Anyone who has experienced the good news. And so if you've experienced the good news, then this is you. This is me. This is all of us who are Christ followers. And then the last one, the third one, how then? If we know why and we know who, then how should we proclaim the good news? Four things, really quickly. How should we proclaim the good news? First thing is this, is we want to begin, we want to begin with prayer. We want to begin with prayer. I'm going to turn over to Acts uh, chapter 8. You don't have to go there. It'll be on the screen uh, back here. But in Acts chapter 8, I love this story. Uh, if I can get there, there it is. Acts chapter 8. We'll get there. We're going to begin, begin with prayer. So here in Acts chapter 8, oh, in verse 26, uh, you, see, uh, you see Philip. Philip is a Christ follower, uh, and he has this experience where as he begins to listen to the Holy Spirit, to lead him and guide him, he has this just incredible encounter with this Ethiopian. And it, it's, pretty, it's pretty incredible. Look at verse 26. It says this. It says, an angel of the Lord. There it is again, right? Here comes a messenger. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. And look at verse 27. It says, so he got up and he went. I love that. <laughs> he's just, he's listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the angel says to him, he says, get up. And I want you to go south. How many of us, feeling that inside of our soul, just would have went, to do what? Why? What are we doing? Where are we going? What time? Am I going to be back in time because I got something going on at 6, right? Like, we would have had, like, so many questions, the angel would have been like, you know what? Let me go find somebody else, right? Like, not Philip, though. Philip's like, it says, he, so he got up and he went. Get up and go south. 
to the road that goes down from Jerusalem. There's, there's, some, there's some detail there, right? Knows, he knows what road he's going to. He knows what direction he's going to. But the, the details don't come to him. He doesn't know what he's going to do when he gets there. He doesn't know why he's going there. He just has this, he has this overwhelming feeling and sense, you know what, I need to go and do this. You ever feel that sometimes? I hope that you do. If we're, if we're listening to the Holy Spirit in our lives, if we're, listening, if we're praying and we're actually listening more as we pray than speaking more when we pray, because sometimes that's a problem, right? We're always talking about, God, do this for me, do that for me, do this, do this, do that. And God's like, I'd love to do these things for you if you'd just be quiet for a minute. I'm trying to tell you. Philip is listening. And so he gets up and he goes south. And so goes not knowing what is to happen when he gets there. And this is the, the, Holy, Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit's guidance usually comes this way to us, one step at a time. Look at verse 29. It says, so, or 27, it says, so we got up and there was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury, and he had come to worship in Jerusalem. 28, it says, and he was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. Now, Philip doesn't know this at this point. He just sees this Ethiopian man riding in this chariot, and then it says, the spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. Right? So this would be, I think, the equivalent to us to being inside of a coffee shop and seeing somebody reading the Bible, and we go and we pull up a chair and do exactly what Philip does. What are you reading? What's that you got there? Right? Which, for us, you know, might catch, we might catch a charge for something like that today. But Philip's just listening to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit says... Go up, and, go up and talk to this Ethiopian. Find out what it is that he's reading. Look at what it says. It says, when Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? But I love this. Like, here's the whole point. Like, you can read the rest of the story and see what happens next. But the whole point here is this, is that as the Spirit of God speaks to us and tells us to get up, to go, like, number one, there's, there's, a, there's something about obedience there that we could talk about. But the, one of the most important things outside of just being obedient to the Spirit as He leads us is that we actually hear the Spirit lead us. And so we begin with prayer. Like when we're talking about proclaiming the good news, like if we begin with prayer, and this is the point that I'm trying to get at here. If we begin with prayer, here's what I'm talking about beginning with prayer, is that what if you started off today or tomorrow and you, you started your day as you prayed and you just said, God, would you show me somebody that needs to hear the good news? Would you show me somebody that, that maybe needs to come to to Christmas Eve Eve services? God, would you show me somebody that maybe I can share my story with or, or even share the gospel with today? Would you show me who that is? Here's, here's the thing that, that I think bothers me about many of us is that there are a lot of us who will not pray that prayer because we don't want the answer to that prayer. It's like, I don't, I don't want to do that. Share the gospel? I don't know how. I don't know what to say. I don't, invite some, I, don't, I don't want to invite somebody because what if they say no? Listen, that's probably the worst thing that would happen to you. They would say, no, it's okay. I go to another church. Cool, great, tell me about it. Can I share the gospel with you? Can I tell you about the good news? Can I tell you? I said, we'll talk about that here in just a second. I'm like, no, it's okay, you don't have to. Like, I'm a believer. Awesome, I didn't know that. Let's talk about that, Right? Like, I think in our minds, like, we have this thing in our minds where we're like, we're going to say that to somebody, and all of a sudden, horns and fangs are going to come out, and they're going to turn into Satan themselves and, like, eat you, right? <laughs> like, we're just, like, so afraid of what's going to happen. They're just going to be like, Ugh! you know, we're just going to be like, no. Oh, sorry, I don't know where that came from. Anyway, all right. We've got to begin with prayer, and we just, we've we got to trust the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the moment to lead us. So we begin with prayer. How should we proclaim the gospel? Secondly, the second thing of how we should proclaim the good news is we just simply share an invitation. 
We just share an invitation. Look at uh, John chapter 1, verse 43. Here's Philip again. It says this, it says, The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And this is how, this is how Philip encounters Jesus and how Philip proclaims the good news to somebody else. So Philip's already had a little bit of experience here, right? It says, The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. This is what Nathanael says. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Listen to Philip's response. Come and see. Come and see. Like, so here's Nathaniel. Nathaniel is skeptical. Have you ever ran across anybody who was skeptical? Like, you start talking about church, start talking about Jesus, you start talking about, you know, spiritual type things, and, and they're always skeptical. Notice what Nathaniel, or notice what Philip does not do. Philip does not go, well, pfft, all right, here we go, brother, let's go. Show you. He didn't do that. He just says, why don't you just come and see for yourself? I don't have to convince you. I, Philip understands something that really hasn't been explained to him in this moment, but he gets it right, and that's simply this, is you and I, it's not our job to save anyone. You and I can't save anyone. But we are, we do know this for a fact, we are told to proclaim the good news to everyone. Philip just says, he says, why don't you just, why don't you just come and see? Come and see. If you ever feel unprepared when people start, uh, or maybe let me ask it this way, have you ever felt unprepared when people start to, to ask you questions about why you believe what you believe? Or maybe start to ask you questions like theological, you know, types of questions. Right? So, so th again, this is Philip. He's like, I, just come and see. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I, I don't know. I know he did. So why don't you just come and see? So Philip shared an invitation to come and see Jesus. And this is what we do when we get to share Jesus with others. Or even just invite them to church. It really is that simple. It really is that simple. Just come and see. And, and I think, it, here's the thing, like, it, when I'm talking about sharing an invitation, like, sharing an invitation sometimes is literally just inviting someone to come to church. I want you to, I want you to really, truly think about this for just a second. When is the last time that you invited someone to come to church with you? I'm not saying that because we want to get tons of people to come to church. I mean, that would be great. That's awesome. That's not why I'm asking you that question. I'm asking you that question because this, this is exactly what Philip was doing. He just said, he said, you know what? I don't have all the answers. Anybody in here got all the answers? I don't have all the answers. Philip's like, I don't have all the answers. I don't know why anything good comes out of Nazareth or doesn't or does. What? Just come and see. Just come and see. Like, let him tell you for himself. And so Philip just simply shared an invitation. And so I'm, I'm praying that that's exactly what we will do. Not, and not just for, like, not just for Eve Eve. Like, Christmas Eve Eve is a great time for you to be able to do that. This, when we have our Christmas services here. It's a great time for you to be able to do that. But not just for that, but, like, every opportunity that you get Every chance that you get an opportunity to share an invitation, to simply just say to someone, hey, come and see. Come and see. I know you got stuff going on in your life. I know you're hurt. I know you're broken. I know that you need healing. And I actually, actually kind of know the answer to all of those questions, but you need to know the answer to all of those questions. So why don't you just come and see? And, and, and maybe for a lot of us, we're like, I've done that. Like I, I've done that. I've asked everybody I know, come and see, come and see. I've already asked everybody, and they've all, they, they just keep saying no. Ask again. Like, ask again. Because you never know when the Holy Spirit is actually working on that person and has prepared them for that moment. Come and see. You see, Nathaniel, after he meets Jesus, has his world flipped upside down. 
And I believe that this is what happens when people meet Jesus. So maybe it's your friend, maybe it's a family member, or, or, or whoever it is that you know. Maybe, maybe that's what hangs in the balance for them. And this is one way that we proclaim the good news. We share an invitation. We begin with prayer, we share an invitation. And then the other thing that we do is that we just simply share the gospel, that we share the good news. This goes beyond inviting them to church, which I I think we should, but sometimes the Holy Spirit actually prompts you to actually share the gospel, the good news about Jesus. This is how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 3. He says this. He says, Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold the message I preached to you. Unless you believed in vain, for I passed on to you, this is what he says, for I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. That's it. That's the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. And so sometimes, like the Holy Spirit just prompts you to actually share the gospel with someone. Not just inviting them to church, that's good, that's great, but an opportunity for you to sit down and say, hey, can I, tell you, like, can I actually tell you about Jesus and about why it's good news that he came as a Savior? And here's the thing about that. Here's a couple of... Two really quick tips on that. First tip is this. Don't be weird. Like, don't make that conversation weird. It doesn't have to be weird. It's probably already weird enough, right? Like, it's probably already weird enough. You, you know, it should go without saying, right? Jesus, Jesus was actually really good about this. He was actually just really natural. He would take natural things, natural conversations, and find ways to work the gospel into these conversations. You look at John chapter 4, he has this conversation with this woman at the well. That's a great example of this. You can just go and, and we don't have time to, to look at it, but you can just go and, and read that for yourself. And Jesus didn't start off with, hey, let me ask you a question. If you were to die tonight, Where would you go? Right? That's not the question that Jesus asked. Jesus doesn't ask them, hey, are you have you been washed in the blood? Like that's save that for your Christian brothers and sisters. You say that to somebody who's not a believer and you're going to jail. Okay? Like that's how that happens today. Don't make it weird. Don't make it awkward. Use common language. Start talking about things that are normal and natural. And then here's the other thing. Here's, here's the other tip. Don't be weird. Don't be awkward. Just be intentional. Be intentional. We can do this by, by going beyond the surface with people. You know, talking to people and saying, hey, how are you? Like, that's, that's good. But don't stop there. Learn to ask good questions and, and listen for opportunities. If we would just listen to people a lot of times, I think you'll, you'll actually, and, and we begin with prayer, asking the Holy Spirit, God, who do you want me to share good news with today? The gospel with, who do you want me to share this with today? Like, I think the Holy Spirit will just tap on the doors of your heart in those moments and be like, hey, remember that thing that you prayed and asked for this morning? Here it is. Here, now's the time. Now's the moment. Uh, I love what Andy Stanley says. I mention this uh, quite often, but he, he, says, he says this. He says, sometimes you just, just listen for people to say like one of three different kind of knots, like N-O-T-S, knots. And he says this. He says, he says you know, when somebody says something to the effect, uh, the effect of things are not going well. You ever have those conversations with people? Hey, how, how was your weekend? That wasn't great. Typical response from us is, oh, man, that stinks. Mine was awesome. Right? Oh, no, I hate that for you. You know, and then we kind of sheepishly just walk off, you know, and then they go, how was yours? Oh, it was good. In a conversation, right? Like, that's it. That's as far as it goes. But when they say, hey, how, how was the weekend? How was your day? How, how are things going for you? Not well any form of not well that's an opportunity for us to stop 
and listen and maybe ask a few further questions. Oh, tell me about that. Why, are, why did things not go well? What, was, what happened this weekend? What happened yesterday? What, what's going on in your life? Which may open the door an opportunity for you to share the gospel with them. The hope that you have is the hope that they need. The, the second one is he says this, you know, again, some form of this. I'm not from here. How many of you in this room are not from here? Look at the, wow, that's awesome. You ain't from around here, are you, right? Like that's our response to that. You ain't from around here, are you? <laughs> not from here. So you meet somebody, and you start talking to them, and they tell you, I'm not from here. Oh, where are you from? Tell me about that. Oh, how was it, like, what brought you here, right? Like, follow-up questions. What, what brought you here? Oh, my job. Oh, that's great. Well, what is it that you do? Like, you can get beyond the surface questions. You can start saying those things. But when people, when people say that they're not from here, what they're also saying to you is that they don't have community here. And that's an opportunity for us to invite them into community, which may give us an opportunity to share the gospel with them in community. And then the third one is he says, he says, not prepared for. And we we hear this one all the time, right? Well, I wasn't prepared for blank. Well, we just weren't ready for whatever, you know. And again, if we begin to just go beyond the surface and ask a few questions, other questions and slow down and invest a little bit of extra time in someone because I listen I know we're all in a hurry we all got to get somewhere we all got to be somewhere you know all that I get that but we got to slow down a little bit to allow the Holy Spirit to work and ask a few further questions and so how should we proclaim the gospel? We begin with prayer. We share an invitation. Maybe we share the gospel. And the last one is this, is maybe we just share our story. Maybe we just share our story. In John chapter 9, there's this uh, great story here uh, where Jesus heals this man who is born blind. And again, you can read the whole story for yourself in John 9, but it, it's the story where, where Jesus has this encounter with a man, again, who was born blind, Jesus picks up some dirt, spits in it, makes some mud pies out of it, puts it on the man's face, right? Tells him to go and wash. He goes and he washes and boom, he can see. First time in his life. First time in his life. In fact, look at verse 8. It says this. It says, his neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar. Uh, as a beggar. So again, all of these people in this town that he was in look at this guy and they see this guy and they're like, this is the guy that we've known all of our lives. And we don't know exactly how long that is, but all of our lives, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 40. We don't really know, but let's say it's 30 years. Like We've seen this guy for 30 years. He's been blind for as long as I can remember. But now, look at what it says. It says, isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Now he sees. Now he sees. And so after being blind, what happens next? Jesus heals him, and he begins to go, and he begins to share his story of what happened to him. Again, just exactly what we said before. Jesus radically impacts his life. He cannot keep it to himself, as should be, and he begins to go, and he begins to share it with everybody that he comes in contact with, right? But what happens next is the church people and religious leaders and all these other people start to ask him a bunch of questions. Like, how did this happen? What happened to you? Who did this to you? All of these questions, right? He starts to get all of these questions asked of him. In fact, they even go and they get the man's parents and they bring the man's parents in and they're like, hey, hey, hey. So here's the deal. We know that this guy used to be blind. We've seen him. We, we, he, he was a beggar. A blind beggar, and, and, but now he can see, like we can see that with our own eyes. What did you do to him? And they're like, we didn't do anything. In, fi in fact, this is what they say. They say, why don't you go ask him again? And so they do. They go and they ask him again. Skip down to verse 25. 
They ask him again. It says, the second time they summoned the man who had been blind and told him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. They're basically saying that the guy like lied this whole time. And this is what he says. He answered. He says, whether or not he, or they're, they're talking about Jesus. They're, they're saying that, that because uh, he keeps telling them that, that Jesus, the Messiah, is the one that healed him. And they're like, no, 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 that man's a sinner. And this is what he answers. He says, whether or not he is a sinner, he says, I don't know. He doesn't, have the, he doesn't have all the answers. He doesn't have all the answers, but this is what he says next. He says, one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. I was blind and now I see. And that's really all of our stories, isn't it? I was blind, but now I see. And again, we don't have to overcomplicate it. Like, there is no more simple message than that. Hey, what, give an answer for the faith that you have. How, how did this happen to you? I don't know. I really don't know. All I know is, is I was blind, but now I see. Listen, if the gospel gets in you, if the gospel gets in you, it should come out of you. If the gospel gets in you, it should come out of you. And when you've been changed by Jesus, you want to see Jesus change others. Saved people, listen, saved people share with people. Saved people share with people. Every single one of us in this room, we are all natural evangelists. Right? Some of you who, who want to overcomplicate this may think, well, I'm not an evangelist. It's not, it's not my gifting. You may not be a gifted evangelist, but you are still called to proclaim the good news, gifted or not. Because the truth is, is every single one of us in this room are natural evangelists. We have evangelized other people to other things. If you've ever told somebody about a great experience at a restaurant that you went to, you evangelized them to go to that res- restaurant. If you've had a great experience uh, at service somewhere and you're like, oh, i got to tell you about it. I had my tires changed at this place and they were awesome and they did this and they did that and this. And then somebody went, oh, that's awesome. Well, that's where I'm going to go and get my tires changed now. You just evangelized them to that. right? We're all natural evangelists. Listen, we will even tell other people about things so that they will go and tell other people about things. That's what we do on social media, isn't it? We tell people about something in hopes that they will tell other people about it. And listen, people, here's the other thing. People might debate you and argue with you about, you know, theological reasons of this or that or, or even why they believe God doesn't exist. But the one thing that they cannot argue with you about is how God has changed your life. They can't argue with you about that. That's exactly what happened with this man. He was like, you know what, I don't, I don't have, maybe he's a sinner, maybe he's not, like, I don't, I don't have the answers to these things, you know, uh, is he the Trinity, you know, is it God in one, three, like, Father, Son, Holy, like, I, I don't have the answer to any of those things, here's what I do know, I was blind, but now I see. So let me, as we close, let me ask you this question, who has God called you to bring the message of good news to this Christmas? Who has God called you to bring the message of good news to this Christmas? If no one comes to mind, then the check engine light needs to be coming on on the dashboard of your soul if you're a believer. We all know somebody. And if you don't know, pray and ask and then listen for the cues to share. Pray and ask and then listen for the cues to share. I want you to, as we close, look at this. Look at how the shepherds respond to experiencing the good news of great joy for themselves. Back to Luke chapter 2. Verse 15, it says, When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem. I love that. Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported, they reported, that's important, the message that they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. 
But Mary was treasuring up all of these things in her heart and meditating on them. And then verse 20, it says, The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. They went and they shared it with others. I hope you will do just that. I hope you will look for ways to share, to proclaim the good news of great joy. The good news of great joy. And listen, it is for all people. And we'll talk about that next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we pray that... Um, As we have heard, Father, that this good news, this good news that you have come to rescue us, to save us, to bring to us hope and salvation. God, I pray for those who are in the room who may be watching later or listening to this later, God. I, God, I pray that if it's been a long time since we've just felt that that tingling inside of our heart and our souls, God, of this good news to come out of us, God. God, would you just well it up into our souls, Father. God, would you fill our hearts and our souls, God, with, with that excitement, God, with that fervor, God, to share this message with someone else, that you have come, that you bring hope, that you are light into all kinds of darkness. And Father, give us the courage to speak boldly. God, give us the courage and the bravery, God, to just, to just open our mouths, God, with someone. God, whether it be to, to invite them to come and see for themselves, God, or, or to just sit down and say, can I tell you about the one who has changed my heart? God, the one, the one that gives me hope. I can give you hope too. That's what, Father, fill us, fill us with the courage. And when we find ourselves in those moments, Father, God, where, where we see someone, God, where we know that someone needs to hear this good news, God, would you make it so evidently clear what it is that we're supposed to do? Just like you did with Philip and the Ethiopian. You just make it so, so clear as to what we're to do, God, and that when we start to, to begin to worry about what we're going to say, God, just as your word reminds us, God, that when we don't know what to say, God, that your spirit will speak for us, that you will speak our words. We just ask these things in your name. Amen. Will you stand to your feet as we sing this song together, as we proclaim the greatness and the goodness of God together and partake in communion together as well? the body of Christ, the blood of Christ that has been given to us and for us. A Savior has come. So we don't just celebrate the birth of Christ, we also celebrate the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Because this is what ultimately brings us the salvation that we have, the hope that we have, the good news that we get to share with others is given to us through his sacrifice. So we invite you to come when you're ready. Go tell it on the mountain The one that we've been waiting for The king of our salvation Born on this day
Well, we're going to uh, we're going to give together here in just a moment and sing the doxology on our way out. But as we get ready to do that, typically today would be uh, the, since it's the first Sunday of the month would be Dollar Club Sunday, and you would have Dollar Club envelopes there in your seat. Uh, we're actually not going to be taking up Dollar Club uh, this month. In fact, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. But you got to come back next week for that to see what that is, okay? So uh, no need to give to Dollar Club this month. Uh, we're going to be doing something just a little bit different, so come back next week for that, and we'll show you uh, what that is. I'm really excited about that, and I hope you will be as well. Uh, we will give together as we head out, and so you can do that by giving in the baskets uh, on your way out, or you can go to ridgegive.com uh, and give that way as well. And so one other thing to let you know about, just to keep in front of you, December the 23rd at 6 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. right here will be our Christmas Eve Eve services. And so we would love for you to come out for that. Again, that's a great opportunity, a great time for you to invite someone. Uh, when you come next week, we'll have invite cards for you that you can take with you and, and give out to, to whomever you choose uh, as well. And so that'll be next week also. And so we hope you'll be back next week as we continue this Advent series uh, together. So let me pray Pray for us. We will give together on our way out, and uh, we will sing the doxology. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we pray that your word just sinks down into our hearts, spring forth fruit, Father, and uh, sends us out, God, with courage and bravery and hope. Father, we pray that as we give, we honor you, that we give generously, that we give sacrificially, and we do it with glad and joyous hearts. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Y'all have a great week.